My name is uh, Mark Kinderchuk. I'm with Intermarket Developments. I'm also the co-chair of this year's ULI Symposium. I'm here with Leslie Wu. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, attending today. Uh, yesterday was very successful. I hope you get a chance to go to all the sessions as well. The virtual reality room is still open today from 9 to 3, so if you get a chance, uh, go in there. And there's four different companies, so if you saw one yesterday, you can see a few more today. Uh, we have a very full agenda with the ULI programming in the morning, City of Toronto this afternoon. So we want to get started and have Leslie introduce uh, our next speaker. So many, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, also thanks to our, my other co-chair, uh, Cindy Rottenberg-Walker. The three of us have had a lot of fun uh, organizing and curating the conference. Um, yesterday morning, around this time, uh, many of you would have met uh, David uh, from IBI. And um, I'm going to welcome him up in a second. But first of all, to thank IBI for second year in a row being a ULI Symposium major sponsor. So round of applause. And with that, I'm going to introduce David. Come on. Thank you, Leslie and uh, Mark. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to launch day two of ULI's Toronto Symposium by introducing Richard Florida, this morning's keynote uh, speaker. Richard Florida is one of the most influential urbanists of our time, which means he really doesn't need an introduction. And that's good, because uh, Mark uh, prodded me just as we were getting up here that time's tight and we've got to get the ball rolling. Um, Fifteen years ago, Richard published The Rise of the Creative Class, which profoundly shaped our thinking about cities and influenced public policy, our design responses at, that uh, have shaped cities themselves as they have re-urbanized over the last uh, uh, past one and a half uh, decades. But caution flags have been raised in his new book, The New Urban Crisis. This is a book that has many of the ominous undercurrents of the dark age ahead by the late Jane Jacobs. But it offers up hope, cautious hope, through the compelling advocacy position which he refers to as inclusive urbanism. The new urban crisis is a call to action that all of us would do well to heed. We are very fortunate to have Professor Florida with us today, his first public appearance in Canada since the release of his book just two weeks ago. And with that, I will invite Richard to the stage. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you so much for that, that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you to Richard, uh, to this incredible staff and the board of this incredible uh, ULI chapter. And I know the ULI very well. In fact, I addressed the board recently and I've been, one of the great things about a book launch when you have friends at the ULI is the ULI always brings out people to book launches no matter where you go, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Columbus, Indianapolis. So they've been our partner on book launch events all throughout. Uh, Canada and the United States, they always bring out a great crowd, but I'll tell you this chapter is really recognized, uh, not only for its fast ascent as a district council, but for its incredible programming. And I've been tracking your progress on, I was in, holy God, where was I yesterday? No, I was not in Atlanta yesterday, I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan yesterday. Um, and uh, I was tracking uh, this conference uh, and this event on social media, and boy, you are just really killing it. Um, I, I think my message is one of cautious optimism and one of great opportunity. And, and I actually think, by, by way of preface, um, and to make this speech very short, uh, when I wrote Rise of the Creative Class, there was a glimmer of hope. And I think Toronto had more of this because Canadian cities in Toronto never really hollowed out the way U.S. cities did. There was a glimmer of hope in many of our eyes, you know, Think about Jane writing back in the 60s about the death and life of great American cities and the way cities were being hollowed out and everything was moving out to the suburbs, people, money, affluence, business jobs. I think there was a glimmer of hopes that cities could be revived. And in that 15 year period, and it's very interesting, only because I, it has nothing, by the way, it has nothing to do with me or rise of the creative class, only because I was picking up signals as I visited cities, and when I'll talk more about it, went to work in cities and, and talked to mayors and urbanists and urban leaders and developed, I could see that the urban revival was coming. I don't think anyone would have predicted the depth of that urban revival, the force of that urban revival. If that could happen, if Detroit could come back, if Pittsburgh could, where I lived for 17 years, could now be seen as a model of urban revitalization, as Newark, New Jersey, my 
boyhood hometown, now is beginning to see young people move back in. If that can happen, that was the harder part. Beginning to make the shift of the next decade or the next 15 years from the kind of winner-take-all urbanism we have today to a more inclusive urbanism and prosperity can be accomplished. I have no doubt about that. Because if cities have revived, if they've attracted people back, if they have revenues and resources, if they have talent and industry and ambition, we can do this. There's no doubt in my mind, but, but that has to start now. And, and what's great and good fortune is it is starting now. I see this in every city I visit. I see this in my conversations with mayors. I see this in my conversations with developers. Let's call developers part of anchor institutions, meds and eds and real estate developers. I see this in my conversations with CEOs. There is, in fact, yesterday, in Ann Arbor, we had a delegation of people for the International Association of Science Parks. The economic developer who gave me my first speaking engagement when he was in Toledo, Ohio, my very first speaking engagement when I was in my 20s, said to me, we failed. The former city planning director of Washington, D.C. said to me, I failed. And, and I said, no, you didn't. You didn't fail. And the reason they said they failed is no matter what they tried, the, it, the development remained ex exclusionary. It made divisive. I said, no, you didn't. You helped make this shift to a kind of better urbanism. Making the next shift is going to require all of our work together, but it can be done. So I was born in 1957, a long, long time ago in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, when I was a kid, think about this. When I was a kid, Newark, the poster child of urban economic decline, was a vibrant, thriving city. I was born in the Italian-American district overlooking the city's Great Branchburg Park, much like our Great Park, where the cherry blossoms were bloomed, where I learned to sled, where my dad taught me to skate. And by the time I was about nine or ten years old, that city was beginning to decline. I've seen what cities when they were up. I've seen them when they were down. I've seen them rise again. And, uh, one hot July day, my, my dad, was taking, my dad uh, was taking me to the Newark Public Library. I wanted to play guitar. I wanted to be a musician. My dad loved music. He loved jazz. He loved big bands. He only had a seventh grade education. He, he couldn't afford to be a musician. And he said, Richard, if you're going to be a guitar player, you're not just going to play rock and roll. That's great. You like the Beatles, and you like the Stones, and you like Jimi Hendrix. That's good. But you're going to learn music. So of course, he found me an Italian, who else would he find? An Italian-American jazz guitar teacher, uh, Mickey Vest who really schooled me in, in guitar playing, and I hated it. Uh, and we were driving from Newark to my guitar lesson. And I heard shots ring out, bang, bang, bang. And my dad said, Richard, get, get down on the floor. And uh, Newark, my home, had exploded in race riots. There were not only police and police vehicles and police, there were armored vehicles. There were tanks. There were National Guards in the street. Uh, as we drove through the street, we could see the fires along the city's commercial zones. We could see the smoke rising out of the neighborhoods. And I didn't know it at the time. I was only a 10-year-old kid. But I was seeing the original urban crisis in real time. I was seeing what happened when our cities were emptied of economic energy, when the, suburban, when the white flight to the suburbs, when industry began to move out, when cities became colonies of lower-income, disadvantaged, and minority people who were exploited and suppressed. I think I wanted to know why. Um, not many years later, 1975, New York was pronounced bankrupt. My parents had moved to a small working class suburb called North Arlington. And on the bluff in that suburb, which bordered the Hudson River, you could see the great towers of New York City, a place I never visited until I was in my late teens. That city was declared the, arguably the greatest city in the world, the most economically powerful city in the world, declared bankrupt. And the president Ford at the time said to the city, go drop dead. Um, I, I, I think these events imprinted a kind of care and intellectual curiosity about cities into my DNA. Uh, I went off to Rutgers College. I got a scholarship. I was lifted out of a very tough Italian-American, Irish-American, Jewish-American. <laughs> 
a little bit mafia. And you guys know my New Jersey accent. I don't have to do that too much for you. But the little bit mafiosa neighborhood where I grew up in, in, in New Jersey, actually, the Sopranos were modeled, extracted, kids I grew up with. Um, I, I think I wanted to understand urban as I went off to college to Rutgers. My parents wanted me to be a doctor. I'm like, that's not going to happen. I'm not very good at science. I got straight C's. Uh, they called a family meeting. They literally called a family meeting where they tried to convince me to be a dentist. I'm like, that's not going to work. My handshake. Um, I was very smart. I said, I should be a lawyer, to which my mother said, lovely Italian woman said, yeah, Richard, you, you'd be a good lawyer. You're a good talker, just like me. Um, but I got the bug. And the bug hit me when I was a sophomore in college when my professor at the time um, said, take the Amtrak train from New Brunswick. New Brunswick is only about 30 miles, 30, 45 minutes from New York City. It was a commuter suburb. Actually, it had hollowed out and had its own urban crisis. Um, take the train to New York and go for a walking tour, basically from the Flatiron. Go start at the Flatiron building and then walk through the Flatiron neighborhood, Gramercy, go down through Chelsea. Chelsea was nothing, just a burned out mess. The meatpacking district was a functional meatpacking district. There was no yuppies and sex in the city and restaurants and Apple stores. There was a meatpacking district, no great hotels, boutique hotels. Um, and then continue on. Go through Greenwich Village and Soho and Tribeca. And here I was, a 19, 18, 19 year old kid with eyes agog. I, I thought cities were dead. I thought cities were like my Newark. But here I could see something, some kind of energy, some kind of electricity, something was happening in New York that I couldn't, but I said, this is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna study. I love, I, 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 it was just in me. Um, I saw intellectuals around NYU. I saw bohemians. I saw artists and punks and people with strange mohawk hairdos. I saw people clad in black. Walk. I saw where Soho was still a manufacturing zone, but artists were squatting and galleries opening. I couldn't believe it. I was beginning to see an urban revival. And I, I went and pursued a PhD at Columbia University. In the 1980s, I saw it happening in real time. I saw the music movement and the art movement. And, and New York begin to attract people. It was an exciting place. I, could, I, I wanted to make sense of it. And then I moved to, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is where the idea for Rise of the Creative Class came from. Because in Pittsburgh, a, a place that had been buffeted by the deindustrialization, the same deindustrialization that cost my father his job in his factory in Newark as that factory shuttered in the late 1970s, had buffeted Newark and Detroit and Pittsburgh even more. Pittsburgh saw the annihilation of tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs in steel and in heavy industry and in chemicals, in all sorts of, it was, a, it was the Silicon Valley of its day. It lost, population shrunk from 900,000 in the city to 350,000. Think about that kind of population loss. Um, it had great universities like Carnegie Mellon where I taught at the time. It was producing technology, but that technology was not sticking. It was not reviving like San Francisco or Boston. That technology was moving away. The talented professors I worked with in computer science, in artificial intelligence, in also internet search were all leaving not only to go to great universities, but to go to Apple and Microsoft and Google. My students all, to a person, were leaving Pittsburgh. And The Rise of the Creative Class was a book about Pittsburgh and about what communities needed to do to harness the urban revival. Three T's. I made those three T's for my mom. My mom said, Richard, you have to be successful, you've got to apply yourself. You have to excel at the three R's, uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Surprisingly, they're actually not three R's. My three T's are actually T's. Technology, talent, and tolerance. You have to invest in technology. It's not enough just to invest in technology. You can build incubation and acceleration in technology startup, but it can go away, just like in Pittsburgh. You have to invest in attracting and retaining talent. But talent, too. I said the biggest export at the time of Pittsburgh was not steel. It was the talented and creative kids Pittsburgh was creating and attracting to its universities. And you had to be tolerant. And of course, Canada 
Toronto figured very heavily in that because I saw that places that were tolerant and open-minded, that treated men and women fairly, that treated gays and straights and singles and fe families fairly, that that didn't recognize ethnic or racial boundaries. And I pointed out that half of the businesses founded in the San Francisco Bay Area were founded by, let's call them new Americans. Um, a phrase that is finally catching on in the United States, by the way. Um, that, that places that had larger concentrations of gays and bohemians actually had higher rates of innovation and economic growth. But that was the year 2002. And in that book, I got the glimmers of the urban revival. Um, I went to visit former mayor of DC, African American mayor, Tony Williams. I agreed to sit on the board of his new policy shop, a brilliant mayor. And he pointed to my book. He had a shelf and he said, with great wit and humor, because DC has seen this urban revival as much as anywhere. Remember, this was a city that itself engulfed in riots, that was down in the dumps, that had been abandoned except for one or two neighborhoods, that has come roaring back and has been completely remade. The creative class is nearly 50% of the metro and probably 80% of the city's uh, population. And he said, Florida, we followed your playbook and you, I'm not gonna use the exact word he used, but let's say he said, you effed us up. And I said, Mr. Mayor, you're gonna like my new book. But we all saw it, not just me. We all see this, we all live this. The urban revival, according to the statistics collected by my brilliant young colleague at the University of Toronto, recruited from Brown University, Nate Baum Snow, the urban revival across Canada and the United States begins in the year 2000. That's when it begins, and the acceleration of this urban revival, of course, which went on in pockets in Toronto, and pockets in Vancouver, and pockets in New York, and pockets in Seattle, but we're talking large-scale urban revival across many metros and many cities, hundreds. It begins in the year 2000. It accelerates through 2010. And as people, young, affluent, talented people, are drawn back to cities to be near the core, to be near jobs and economic opportunity, to be near amenity, to be around knowledge and research institutions like the University of Toronto, uh, like MIT, like we can go on and on around great amenity, the coastlines of Los Angeles, the Great Lake and mountain districts, around subways and transit stops to mitigate their commutes. That's when it goes on. Now, I, I was thinking about this in the year 2003, nine months after Rise of the Creative Class was published, I wrote an article in the Washington Monthly I remind people this is well before the Occupy movement, well before Thomas Piketty wrote his book on the 1%. I pointed out that the most creative economies, the most innovative economies, the densest and largest metros were also the most unequal. But it wasn't until I moved to Toronto that I was forced to confront the reality of the new urban crisis because I, like Jane Jacobs, came to our urbanist nirvana. I was coming to the place that excelled at tolerance, that was accepting, that in the eyes of Americans, maybe not our eyes, was building, 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 had more cranes in the sky. We have our own NIMBY problems that we know about, but according to Americans, was overcoming NIMBYism. We have our issues on transit, I'll get to those, but in the eyes of American urbanists, was a leader on transit, a place where there is virtually an absence of violent crime, where there is health care for all, where there is a social safety net that mitigated the kind of economic anxiety that resulted in the election of George W. Bush. And guess what happens? As I step into urbanist nirvana, I'm working at the time with Mayor Miller and Kyle Ray on an inclusive prosperity agenda for affordable housing, investment in transit, upgrading the jobs of service workers, and barely got our foot in the door of Toronto, then into the office of mayor, steps our great gift to the world's nighttime comedians and humor, Rob Ford. Talk about culture shock, cognitive dissonance. How, how could this happen in Toronto? How could this be? This is the place of urbanist, progressivist nirvana. This is the place we point to when we, this is where Jane Jacobs moved after all. 
And therein started the real introspection. Trying to grapple with intellectually, humanistically, where this came from. And, you know, it wasn't hard when you have brilliant colleagues at the University of Toronto, like David Holchansky, or the young political scientist who's now left the University of Toronto, Zach Taylor. It isn't hard to figure out where this came from. It was the backlash. It was the backlash to the very urban revival we all want and I championed. It was, it was the backlash as people looked at the rise of an urban elite, a creative class, knowledge workers, packed in and around the core, around those knowledge institutions, around the subway and transit stops, with everybody else pushed further and further and further afield. Uh, and, and that's when I knew I, I had to dig in. And this book is the product of seven years of, of work stimulated. If, if Newark got me interested in urbanism, if Pittsburgh produced Rise of the Creative Class, it's Toronto that, that made me make this next shift. By the way, I'm always late to the party. Uh, Jane Jacobs, if you do read Dark Age, which is a prescient book, massively criticized at the time it was written, by the way, and, and seen as the work of an aging kind of crank. Uh, prescient about what would happen, how the pillars that held up our modern democratic society were falling apart. She talks about in that book, Toronto's new urban crisis. She says it. Toronto is beginning to experience, this is in 2004, a new urban crisis, a shortage of affordable housing, a shortage of transit. If this doesn't get, if, if people don't de begin to deal with this, this is going to metastasize. She saw it more than a dozen years ago. I came late to the party. But I said in, you know, I, I, I went out on a limb. I did call Mayor Ford the most anti-urban mayor in world history. I did go out on a limb. I'm an American. I have a big mouth. Um, but I also said Rob Ford was a signal to the world. A signal, and, and, and honestly, he was Toronto's signal. Rob Ford was a benign version of populism. As much as I disagreed with him on bike lanes and the crazy Ferris wheel and all of that, he was a benign, in many ways, it's misunderstood, he was a multicultural and multi-ethnic version of populism. He didn't draw racial divides. It wasn't simply about the white working class. He, it, he had new Canadians as part of his coalition. But, but I could have never anticipated the Brexit. And I said to my friends, oh my God, with Rob Ford in Toronto and the Brexit, the Americans will never be crazy enough to elect Trumpy. And of course, we had our, the, you know, the, the Americans in the neighborhood, we had our election night party. We had our giant statue of Hillary, our baby, our little baby and dog dressed in red, white, and blue, ready to have the cork, uncork the champagne. And uh, it's probably one of the most depressing nights of my life. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't talk. And my wife woke up the next day, my wife, Rana, and said something that was, well, she is incredibly brilliant and does everything that allows me to do this. She really runs the business and runs everything. She said something that was remarkable and was in tears. And as she was in tears, I learned something about gender that I hadn't fully appreciated, how women projected so much of their ambition on Mrs. Clinton. I, I supported Mrs. Clinton. I care about Mrs. Clinton, but not to that level, not to that emotive level. She said, if we're this shattered, if we're this broken, Richard, we're advantaged. We live in a nice neighborhood. You teach at the University of Toronto. We have a nice little business. You get to give speeches and write books. If we're this shattered, imagine if Mrs. Clinton had won what the advocates and devotees of Trump Nation would feel. And I called my publisher, because if anyone saw the galleys of this book, it was a different book. Um, sometimes reviewers review the galleys, which is hysterical. They're reviewing a book that was never really written. Um, <laughs> uh, I always encourage them to read the real book. So I, I called my publisher and said, pull the book back. I have to rewrite it. So then a seven-year project was reduced to two weeks, but I did successfully rewrite the book and meet the publication date. And I rewrote it because I, I realized that the new urban crisis was the cause not only of our economic and urban problems, but the cause of our political and cultural divide. It was the central crisis, economic, social, cultural, and political crisis of our time. 
And I came to realize something Jane Jacobs knew well before me. See, see in the book, I called for top-down solutions. I thought if, if my president won, Justin Trudeau was our leader here in Canada, I thought that we could do top-down solutions. I, I advocated in the original, it's not in the new version of the book, I make an allusion to this, I, I said that the United States should set up a President's Council on Cities, equivalent to the National Economic Council, equivalent to the National Security Council, a big deal. And that president, President Clinton, should staff that with leading mayors and urbanists and developers to develop an agenda for reinvestment in cities and overcoming the new urban crisis. But now I knew this was no longer possible and that we had to chart a different road. So what is the new urban crisis? It, it, it comes from a very fundamental contradiction. And, I, and, I, and, and Jane was the first person to, to really understand this. And when we would talk in Toronto, she said, you know, I, I think I made an advance, Richard, humbly she would say this, that is different than most economists and urbanists. She said, most people think that economic growth comes from companies. Think about, think about here. Think about the debates we have here. Competitive, productivity, innovation, where Canada and Toronto lag. It comes from companies. We're losing our large firms. We're being hollowed out. Blackberry is being replaced by this one. We need to invest in innovation. It comes from R&D and acceleration and incubation. And Jane said, yeah, 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 fine. Where innovation really comes from is from people who come together in communities and cities in that clash and clamor of ideas as we combine and recombine, whether that's in arts, whether that's in music, whether that's in Silicon Valley style innovation, it's out of that clash and clamor of people in small companies and institutions. The city itself is the platform of economic growth, not the firm, not the company. It's clustering that is the source of innovation, enterprise, entrepreneurship, and economic growth. That very clustering, that very clustering, that is the source of economic innovation, the source of productivity enhancement, the source of job generation economic growth is the very thing that is carving deep divides in our society. It's a Janus-faced, two-headed monster. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean we should stop clustering and bust apart our cities and stop investing in them. We have to figure out a way to harness this clustering force to make clustering work not against us but for us. We have to make that clustering not create an exclusive kind of prosperity where the advantaged 1% or 10%, in my view the advantaged third, the creative class of knowledge workers, where this advantaged class gets the lion's share of the benefits and working people and blue collar people and service people and hospitality and tourism and retail and, and clerical work could push further and further out and further and further behind. That's our agenda. And it's one we can accomplish. So what are the dimensions of the, the new urban crisis? If that's the fundamental contradiction. And it, it's, not, it's, it's not economic or class inequality. It's not just a divide between the knowledge workers and the, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inequality that is reinforced by geography. In, in fact, I'd encourage you to think about it this way. Economic inequality is bad and it's awful and we have to mitigate this, but spatial inequality is worse. The fact is that we occupy completely distinct and separate world. The urban voter versus Trump nation, the Obama supporter versus Trump nation. We occupy different worlds. We do not come in contact with one another. We are unequal across places and within. Uh, the first dimension of the new urban crisis is, is, is something I call winner-take-all urbanism. We not only live in a winner-take-all economy, well, in the past 20 years, CEO salaries have grown by 1,000%, and workers' wages have not budged. That's winner-take-all economy. But we also have a winner-take-all urbanism, where London and Paris and Amsterdam and New York and Boston and Seattle and San Francisco, these knowledge and tech hubs, and Toronto and Vancouver are enormous winners. The statistics on this are terrifying. And this is what has produced Trump and Brexit and Le Pen and the backlash in across Europe. The success of winner-take-all cities and the fracturing and fragmenting and falling behind of the rest. 
In the United States, the five largest metros account for 25% of GDP. In Canada, where we think of ourselves as a non-urban country, the five largest metros account for 50% of GDP. Toronto, the GTA, accounts for nearly a fifth of our GDP versus 8.9% for New York City. Um, in the United States, the San Francisco Bay Area has increased its share of startups from 20% in 1970, people talk about the rise of the rest, the rest aren't rising so fast. 20% in 1970 to nearly 50% today. In Canada, our startups are clustered in Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal, in even greater extent. In the United States, the San Francisco Bay Area and the Boston, New York, Washington Corridor account for two-thirds of all high-tech startups. The only place other than San Francisco that's increased its level of startup activity and venture is New York City. Fine, think about Toronto. Finance, entertainment, media, and now technology. If you include Waterloo, you have a microcosm of the entire economy in one place. Um, this is just remarkable. I, I tell this story in real estate terms. By the way, the book is mainly US focused. That's because of US publishers. I apologize in advance. So at the Martin Prosperity Institute, we wrote a separate report, which we released earlier this week on Canada's new urban crisis. It's online at our site. In the US, one apartment, a two bedroom apartment in Soho, for the price of that, you can buy 28 single family homes in Memphis, Tennessee. People think still Toronto is, oh, well, New York and London are expensive. Toronto, no, it's not. When it's one and a half million dollars for a detached single family home, it is not affordable. Toronto, according to the most recent data, is the ninth least affordable city in the world on a housing cost to income basis. It is less affordable than the New York metro area, comparable to inner city center London, where, income, where housing prices are higher, but incomes are higher. The average Torontonian, the cost of their house is now eight times their income. These are the symptoms of a winner-take-all urbanism, where there is geographic separation between regions. But the second dimension is the winners have their own crisis, the crisis of their own success. And that is seen in growing housing unaffordability, and not just housing unaffordability for the creatives, that's the minor problem. In fact, our research shows that the creative and knowledge class, even with this housing price push, still can survive, even though some young people are being kept out of the market. We don't see any real diminution in creativity and innovation. In fact, in Toronto, in San Francisco, in New York, we see increased creative capacities as formerly artistic and design and finance cities add technology in the United States, half of all venture capital startups are located now in urban centers. In two neighborhoods in San Francisco and downtown, collect more than a billion dollars in venture capital a year, investment each. <laughs> in Toronto, the share of our venture capital investment in the city center, if it's half in the United States, is over three quarters. So these cities are consolidating their advantages and becoming centers of finance, media, entertainment, arts, culture, design, and technology. But the way this shows up, and, and you know, they, if it continues, they could become creative dead zones, and certain neighborhoods have certainly become creative dead zones. But the way this shows up is in the segmentation of our society. If the creative class, if the members of the knowledge class, even paying for this extraordinary housing, have 50 or 60 or in some metros even 80 or $90,000 in income left out after paying for their housing, in Canada, the members of the service and blue collar working class have $15,000 left over. What happens is they are pushed further and further and further out to the periphery. How can you run a city? This is the crisis of the winners. How can you run a city that's disdivided, where neighborhoods are no longer cohesive, where service and blue collar workers have, and you know the math, an hour or 90 minute or more commute? I can tell you this because I travel. There is no place, not even Los Angeles now, that looks like our highways. 
no place. You can get from LaGuardia or JFK or Reagan National or Dulles or even LAX, never mind Chicago. We have a level of congestion and stymieing of circulation that really now is, is unmatched. Maybe only Los Angeles is the only place that comes close to us. Then a city begins to break down. And once a metropolitan area hits five and a half to six million, you have to grow differently. Once you get to Toronto size or Miami size or DC size or Boston size or San Francisco Bay Area size, you either invest in transit and density or you break down. You, you can no longer grow by sprawling and investing in rows. It does not work. To scale to 10 to 15 to 20 million, you have to grow differently. The third dimension of the new urban crisis, and this is why it's so much bigger than the old urban crisis, the crisis of the suburbs, the crisis of Ford Nation, the crisis of the Trump voter. Uh, our suburbs used to be places of affluence, of a Canadian or American dream. They are now sharing in the pathologies of the worst of the old urban crisis. Poverty is growing, is bigger and growing faster in the suburbs. Crime is growing. The opioid epidemic, I could go on and on and on. The suburban dimension of the new urban crisis is even bigger than the urban one. That's why it's not just about cities. It's about entire metropolitan regions. Uh, my great teacher, the great David Lewis, a Jane Jacobs-like figure of urban design, told me this 20 years ago. He said Florida in his incredible South African accent the cities will be able to revive. They have wonderful infrastructure. They have train stations. They have transit hubs. They have great buildings. Look at your own Newark. Look at what's happening in Detroit and downtown. The suburbs don't have any of that. They're disconnected. They're far away. They have shoddy infrastructure and shoddy homes. And then the biggest dimension, the signature dimension of the new urban crisis, the one that David Holchansky identified here first. If the old urban crisis was about the flight of the middle class to the suburbs, the flight of the middle class from my Newark or Detroit or Pittsburgh, from those great cities, New York City, the flight, <laughs> it's a great book on the future of New York called The Anatomy of a Metropolis, published in around 1959 or 1960, Hoover and Vernon, two great economists. The flight from density, think about that, the flight from density. We were seeing a flight to the suburbs of the affluent, of the middle class. Our cities were hollowing out and there was a middle was disappearing. The new urban crisis, its fundamental dimension, is the evisceration of the middle across the board. As, as David Holchansky pointed out in that remarkable report on the three cities of Toronto, which helped me understand the new urban crisis, that and Rob Ford here, it's not just the middle class that's declining. It's something much more important, and, and this is what we have to help our, our leaders, municipal leaders, provincial leaders, national leaders understand. It's not just economic inequality, it's spatial inequality. It's geographic isolation. The geographic effects are more. The geographic effects on limiting mobility, on keeping kids down. You know, I'm, I'm a great story of economic mobility. I was born in Newark one of the worst cities and places to grow up in the United States. My parents moved me, Raj Chetty's research shows us, moved me to North Arlington, New Jersey, and put me in a Catholic school in Southern Bergen County, one of the, they didn't know this, one of the best places for socioeconomic mobility. I got a Garden State scholarship and went to Rutgers and had a life of economic upward mobility. You leave a kid in a place like Newark or a disadvantaged area across the United States or Canada, and there is very little hope now for socioeconomic mobility. There is geographic isolation, which impedes access to everything you need. And we know this, rates of economic mobility across the board, particularly in the United States, but also in Canada, have been severely affected. So what David identified, David Holchansky, is it wasn't just a decline in the middle class. It was the decline and evisceration of the middle class neighborhoods the places that were the platforms for upward mobility, social capital accumulation, a Canadian or American dream. David showed in his work that two thirds of Torontonians lived in a middle class neighborhood in the year 1970. By the year 2005, of course, because of the Harper discontinuing our census. Uh, by 2005, the last data that we have good data, 30% of Canadians, uh, Torontonians lived in middle class neighborhoods. The same sorts of declines have happened in Vancouver and Montreal. 
Well, I trace this for metros across Canada, across the United States, in certain areas of Europe. There'll be a European edition of this book launching in the fall. The statistics for the United States, and, and think about that. That's going to, for 2005 to 2015, if that's the area of the urban revival, that 30% is going down. So from two thirds to far less than 30% of Torontonians, as we split into areas of concentrated affluence and wealth, and larger spans of concentrated disadvantage. In the United States, between the year 1970 and today, the share of Americans living in middle class neighborhoods declined from two thirds to 40%. And that number is going down. In 203 of 230 metros for which the Pew Data Center has information, 203 of 200 and some, over nine in 10, the middle class has declined across the United States. The middle class decline has been greatest where? In the largest, densest, most productive, most innovative, most knowledge intense, most creative class metros in Canada, in the United States, and across the world. We have hollowed out the middle of our economy, and the word city and suburb no longer have any useful meaning. It used to be that there were poor people in cities and rich people in suburbs, and then people said we had an inversion. There were rich people in the city and poor people in the suburbs, but we know that doesn't capture the reality. Yes, maybe in Toronto there are more affluent people in parts of the core, but we still have horribly disadvantaged neighborhoods in the core. Look at a place like New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, Philadelphia, where you walk down the city street and make a, Chicago, you make a wrong turn, you're in an area of concentrated poverty. The suburbs aren't all poor in Toronto, in New York, in San Francisco, across the United States, Canada, and the world. Some of our richest neighborhoods, in fact, our very richest neighborhoods, postal codes, remain in the suburbs. Inequality, geographic inequality, spatial inequality cuts through both. That's why I call it a patchwork region, a patchwork metropolis. It is no longer a class divide based on city and suburb. It's a patchwork where there are spans of concentrated advantage around the core, around subway and transit hubs, around knowledge institutions, some of those knowledge institutions. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ann Arbor, Michigan, a little college town, ranked fourth in the country behind San Francisco, Boston, and Seattle on my creativity index, and it is in the top 10 on the new urban crisis index. So it, it, it's not just an urban crisis, it can happen around any kind of knowledge hub, any kind of knowledge cluster, as well as large, dense, propulsive cities. It's the fundamental crisis of our time, as that middle has fallen out. As that middle has fallen out of our society. Think about, think about this. A world, a geography, of small areas of concentrated advantage ensconced, almost like there are invisible barriers around those areas, and sometimes not so invisible, certainly in the United States with the police presence, areas of concentrated wealth and advantage that are growing and growing, where that one house in Soho, one apartment in Soho is equivalent to 28 in Memphis, 50 in Youngstown, where you increasingly have to be a rich person or have the bank of mom and dad to buy in, where those advantages of location are reproduced over time, and then larger and larger spans of concentrated disadvantage. You know what this looks like to me? The third world. T to me, it looks like a Latin American city. No, it's not as violent as a Latin American city. No, we don't experience it that way. We don't have to drive to work in an armored car. But it's geography, it's topography, the, the falling apart of that middle is terrifying. And, and that's why we have to move from the old age of winner-take-all urbanism to a fuller and fairer urbanism, to a more inclusive kind of urbanism, to a new era of inclusive prosperity, to, to a new time of urbanism for all. That's what the last bit of the book is about. Now, we have certain advantages in Canada. One is we don't have Trump. And we have a, a vertical separation of powers, a federalism that can be very effectively used for this new age. In, in the United States, I say cities and metros are going to have to go it alone. 
They're going to have to go it alone. There will be no hope and no help from the states, which are controlled by increasingly red and conservative, long anti-urban bias. If you think that's here, it's magnified in the states. And the federal government is going to cut, 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 cut. There will be no help left. Um, in, in Canada, we have an advantage because our federal government can contribute, our provinces can and are contributing, and our cities have pretty darn good leadership. You know, the Ford thing, I think, was a wake-up call for us. And when I look around, and I participate in Mike Bloomberg's, I organized Mike Bloomberg's City Lab conference for him. When I look around at the interesting, especially younger mayors, the Nahid Nenshi's, the Don Iveson's, our own John Tory, uh, but when I look around at some of the most interesting younger mayors, the most innovative mayors are coming out of Canadian cities. So we have advantages in our vertical separation of powers that can be reharnessed. What do I think we need to do? Uh, the first thing we need to do is build more. Now we're building a lot here, and we're still not keeping up. And we know that. We need to build more. And we are a model. I, I know we sometimes self-criticize and self-flagellate. But for Americans, we are a model of building. We still have to build more, because as much as we build, we can't keep up with the demand for our great global spiky city. We have to overcome NIMBYism. We got a lot of NIMBYism, people. New York has its NIMBYism. DC has its NIMBYism. This city has its NIMBYism. I talk in the book when I got hit square in the face. I wrote a little op-ed for the Toronto Star, which said, heretically, we should consider having jets at the island airport. I didn't say we should, we must. I said we should consider having jets at the island airport. I don't care how you feel. Because maybe this connective fiber was good for us. The hate I got back from my people in the urban community, <laughs> I was like I was a heretic that I left Jesus on the cross. Let's have an open conversation about this. We have to consider all the options. If we have the backlash from the right, which is Ford Nation and Trumpism, the backlash from the left is this kind of nimbyism. Colbert would have said, I got mine. I live in a nice, low-rise, wonderful neighborhood with green face, so screw you. <laughs> this isn't nimbyism. This is the new urban Luddism. The Luddites who smashed the machines were holding back the progress of capitalism. When we hold back urban progress, when we say no to any kind of densification, when we resist this kind of density, we know that cities need density to scale. Now, I'm not saying, like market urbanists, get rid of land use restrictions. I say that we have a scarce number of great urban neighborhoods with the right mid-rise density, with the right collection of refurbishable, repurposable, you know, as Jane said, new ideas require old buildings. Those are in scarce supply. We need to preserve them. But we also need to do density right. We need to commit to a new era of affordable housing. And fortunately, in our city, in our province, we are doing this better than most other places in North America. But we need to turn the dial from single family home ownership in sprawling suburbs, which is still incentivized, not as bad as the states where there's a mortgage interest tax deduction, but we still create subsidies for roads and so on and so forth. We need to create more incentives for the construction of affordable housing, social housing, rental housing. That's what people need to get a toehold. And when young people, the poor and the working class can't live in the core. We got a problem. We need to up the game on transit. We will not grow based on roads. No place will grow based on roads. We need to invest in transit. We need to really redouble our efforts there. Uh, we need to commit to upgrading service jobs. We need to commit to making those service jobs in which 50% of Canadians and 50% of Torontonians work. We need to make sure that our social safety net is in place for the knowledge age. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, because I'm, I'm, I'm a professor and I come from the Del Castro School of Public Speaking, so I could go on and on forever. <laughs> and this is more the case in the United States than here, but it's going to catch up with us. Because we are the place where Ford rose and Ford Nation rose. We've got to learn to respect our differences. And that's what the election of Ford and Trump especially, that's what my wife's comment after Mrs. Clinton lost was about. That's why I held out my hand and wrote an opinion piece with my nemesis, Joel Kotkin. We need to respect each other's differences. I may want to live a so-called blue life. 
I may want to live in a dense urban center, if I'm an American, without guns, with rights for all different kinds of people. And I believe those things are important. I may want to see investment in transit, but you know there are a lot of other people that don't. We can't force our way on them. And so I think there has to become an increasing recognition at the national level in the divided society that there's not just one way. That people can peacefully coexist by respecting each other's differences. And it's not my way or your way. It's not a Trump way or a Clinton way. It's not a Ford or a Nenshi way. I could go on and on. It's everyone. And, and by doing that, we have to devolve more and more power to the local level. We have to make sure people feel that they can control their neighborhoods, they control their cities. And here, Toronto has a big advantage, and Canada has a big advantage. Because our federal government is weaker. And our provinces are stronger. Our cities are still not strong enough. Uh, but our, our federal government is weaker than the imperial presidency and overblown nation state of the United States. And I think, to, to put this in perspective, I think more is coming our way. And this is why we have to double down. Uh, with Trump in office in the United States, Toronto, this city faces probably the greatest opportunity in its young life. Um, I can tell you, I don't have any of this confirmed, but I can tell you because I'm in the States a lot on book tour, more and more of America's leading technology companies, leading knowledge institutions, are looking for ways around Trump's immigration restrictions, are looking for places outside the United States that are close by and easily connectable that they can put people they need to run those businesses that come from other countries. The pressures on Toronto from this very growth of a global city, from this incredible boom of urban revival, this opportunity is going to get bigger and the problems are going to get worse. It's time that we up our game, that we double down, that we understand that we have been at the height of the urban revival and perhaps the biggest beneficiary, and redouble our efforts to move from winner-take-all urbanism to a more inclusive prosperity for all. Thank you for listening and thank you for your work to build this here in our great city of Toronto. Thank you, guys.